Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming along today to Karen Spark Jones' presentation lecture for 2019. It's great to see so many of you. And I'm absolutely delighted to be honoured to introduce this presenter today um, for many different reasons. And I'm also very proud that IBM can sponsor this event um, because computing is too important to leave it to men alone. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I first started at IBM 20 years ago, um, I used to turn up to women in technology events. And I used to honestly go, why do we need these events? I used to be the troublemaker. I used to go, and I used to go along to tell them this as well. But I think that's because I came from a lucky background. You know, I had a, a father who inspired, encouraged me to do what I wanted to do. I had two older brothers, so I did what they did. And I went to the University of Edinburgh and I did chemistry. And it never bothered me that the, the class was mainly males. Didn't worry me at all. Went on and did a PhD and I left with no concerns or issues. So how did I go so quickly from into the workplace to thinking actually these events are very important to highlight the work of women. So, you know, I work for a company that strives every day to make sure that we are doing diversity and inclusion and has won numerous awards on that subject. So why did I feel like that? I think it's due to unconscious bias that's all around us. You know, we have an IBM, we ask everyone to sign up and pledge that they'll be equal. They'll treat everybody equally. We do that for men, for women, for execs, non-execs, everyone. But you know, we have our children using female uh, assistants, um, virtual assistants, giving orders to females to order food, do this, do that. Exactly. And it, it is an issue. Um, you know, my husband, was, made, was given a package three years ago from work and was out of work for a period of time and has recently just gone back into the workplace. On Sunday there, I was hanging up a wash and my six-year-old son came out and said, Mom, why are you doing that? That's Dad's job. <laughs> I did actually think, do I correct him? Oh. Or, you know, his wife may, or partner in the future might actually appreciate that, but no. It's everybody's jobs to say there isn't jobs by gender. It's everybody's responsibility to be equal and to treat everybody equally. So I told him that and he actually accepted it and went away quite happy. So Karen Spark Jones was a great pioneer in this, this field of statistics and logistics. logistics. And she um, you know, was a very big advocate on females in these, this field. So the work that she did, you know, was, was brilliant. She, a lot of the work that she did has resulted in the things that we use every day in the search engines. So when she was trying to get people to code, or people were being told they had to code, she said, no, I'm going to teach computers natural language. Wonderful. But she also did warn about the risks of technology being led by people who didn't understand the social implications. You know, we need to think about when an algorithm says that John is a better programmer than Mary, we need to know that that data is actually correct and that unconscious bias hasn't crept in there. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, how much does AI affect our lives? You know, it now affects whether you're hired or fired whether you can get insurance, the cost of products that you can buy on a platform. So my train ticket down here, I got a different price on my mobile phone than what I was getting on my computer. Why is that? And any females here who have been to uh, an airport and gone through e-passport control, you've probably been taken aside because the algorithms were developed using predominantly male white businessmen which actually is a good thing if you are female and want to rob a bank that you know that facial recognition is not quite there. <laughs> but when you want to get home after a long flight, it's really annoying. <laughs> so um, all these things, it's not all doom and gloom. What we do 
need to not leave it just to the men. Computing is too important. The reason we, the way that we get around this unconscious bias is to make sure that we've got a diverse team and are using diverse data sets. So on that, I'm absolutely delighted that today's talk, we have Mirella um, Lapata from the University of Edinburgh. She's in the informatics school. Uh, her research is focused on getting computers to uh, understand natural language. Uh, she has had several awards, including the Karen Stark um, Jones Award, uh, Microsoft Award with the, the British Computer Society. Uh, she was the first person, in fact, to get that award. And that's given out for people who uh, increased the science field in the area of information retrieval and uh, natural language processing. She's also given awards uh, for best papers at numerous NLP conferences and has sat on the editorial board of uh, research journal for AI and uh, co computing logistics. And, uh, and also in 2019, uh, she was made a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So absolutely delighted to have you here today. We need more role models. We need to get the number of people interested in this area so that they can give their voices and make sure those data sets are actually correct. So I'd like to welcome you to the, to the stage. Uh, th thanks very much. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay, because I can never hear. Let me, I have to press one button here. It's supposed to switch. but it's not switching. <laughs> ah, I know why. I know why. Hello, hold on. I know why. Because my computer has gone to sleep. <laughs> uh, yes, OK. Uh, now it should come on. Yes, OK, right. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction, and I'm happy that uh, some of you made it uh, to the talk. Um, so uh, the title is uh, Translating from Multiple Modalities to Text and Back. And don't worry if you don't understand, it will be explained. And I know that uh, this is a formal lecture and you're supposed to ask questions right at the end. But if something is unclear and you think I've lost you, by all means do ask um, while I'm going on. Okay, so let's start. So there is this publication called, yes? Can you drop the lights a bit? Yeah, uh, uh, can you please drop the lights a bit because these lovely people see it faint here. I did ask for this when I came. I said, oh, the lights are not good. And they said, oh, we'll play with it. Actually, this should, there should be no lights there, yes. I don't know how to do this. Oh, be much better. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, are people aware of these digital trends? It appears every year, and it basically tells us about uh, the worldwide phenomenon of the fact that we are all digital now. So, and every year, um, there are different trends, and they're always on the upward. So if you see here, um, there is uh, 7.6 billion people. This is the total population. And two-thirds of those are users of mobile phones. So they have mobile phones. And then 4.3 billion are internet users. And this has uh, increased substantially since last year. And then 3.4 uh, use social media um, or other mobile services. Now, what's important about this is that, and they do further analysis. This is a big publication. You can find it online. And what they do say is that Google continues to dominate the rankings of the world's most visited websites. So most people have access to the internet. And if you have access to the internet, chances are you're going to use Google to look for something. So even though we are all like, you know, on Facebook and we tweet and whatnot, our primary usage of the internet is search engines. 
And so you may ask, OK, so how good are these search, search engines? And are people happy using them? So there is this society called the Internet Society who did a user survey. And they found out a very interesting fact. 72% of Internet users find it very frustrating when they're using search engines, and in particular, when they get irrelevant information when web searching. They don't like it. And this is also corroborated by a statement that Larry Page made a few years back. And he said, you may think using Google is great, but I still think it's terrible. And here's the guy who actually has made billions out of the search engine. And of course, this shows us their ambition. You know, they want to take over the world. But the truth is, people find it frustrating using search engines. So let, let's, let's, let's see why. So there's three reasons, if you can break it down. So first of all, people's needs have changed. So now, when you use the internet, you're not only looking, you're not only looking for text, but you have a lot of other needs. So you may want to look for text, but also images. You may want to look for a song or for source code if you're a student and you want to see, you know, how do I write this function, for formulas. So the way we see the internet has changed. And then, of course, there is the very real problem of information overload. So you get too many hits. Many of them are irrelevant or contradictory. Information is duplicated. There is no structure. You have to go very further down to find what you're looking for. And then you have forgotten what you wanted to find out in the first place. And of course, there is the third bit, which is that a large part of the web's content is inaccessible to most people. Because the world are not only you know, uh, educated males or females. There is non-native speakers, there is immigrants, there is children who go to these websites and they don't understand what they say because it's not written to the level of their education or ability. Okay, so we have this frustration. And I, my argument to you today, what I, I, I want to put forward is that some of this frustration can be alleviated using natural language processing. So we want to make the users happy. We want to actually get rid of the frustration. And NLP can be used to render information more accessible. And how can we do that? We can translate either within the same language by making complicated information simpler or between language and different modalities. So think, for example, you're looking for a song which is in audio, but you are typing your search query in text. Or you're looking for an image, and you're typing everything. And this is already happening. You can do Google search images, right? Um, so let's see a few examples here. Um, I have a horse, and I'm looking for somebody riding a horse. And you can see that the arrows go both ways, because the translation can be from image to text or from text to image. You can query with an image or you can query with a text. Um, here's another example where we have a source code and I look for this source code by natural language. So it defines a function with an argument and blah, blah, blah. Another example, if I have a database, they, nobody can search databases even though they exist. You can query them if you know SQL. Average people don't know SQL, but it could be that, you know, put in a, a query like that. And we want NLP to be able to take this data as input and translate them into natural language. Another example, which is now translating from within the textual modality, we have this article and we generate a summary. This will again help the information overload. We, we don't need to read these big texts. We can just read a few snippets. Um, and another one, another example is this big knowledge graph databases. Um, so it, it used to be called Freebase. Google had this Freebase, which was a big, big, big knowledge base. Now they call it Google Graph. There is millions of entities there with connections. It's not possible to actually look for, you know, humanly possible to look at this graph. But what you can do is you can create translations between parts of this and natural language so that you can ask questions like which animals eat owls. 
Okay? Now, so throughout this talk, I'm going to illustrate examples of how NLP um, can be used to uh, do this translation, either from one modality to language, which is not language, or from within language. Like I take complicated language and I make it simpler, or I take a long text and I make it shorter. Now, and you may think, why is this possible? How did this happen? And there is a very good reason why nowadays we are at a position where we can actually be doing this research. Um, and there is two reasons for this. So the first reason is there is data that is easily accessible. If, if two thirds of the population have a mobile phone and if more than half have access to internet, these people are creating data. So, and here's a few statistics just, just to realize the amount of data that is out there. So 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. And at least 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is produced every day. And if you don't know what a quintillion is, it's a one with 18 zeros. So this is a lot of data. And this is the other staggering statistic. This is a very recent one. Um, uh, it would take a person approximately 181 million years to download all the data from the internet. So the first, the first reason, like I said, why we can be even thinking about doing this research is there's a lot of data out there that we can actually um, exploit. And the second one is, is machine learning revolution of neural networks. Can I see a show of hands? Have people actually, I'm sure the students know of neural networks, have, have people used neural networks? Are they using them? Okay. Okay, good. So um, neural networks, are to the point now that they're not even new. Uh, we go like, yeah, we're using neural networks. But it's important to highlight that, that there has been, you know, the technology was not there, let's say, 10 years ago. And there has been a series of people um, and a series of scientific breakthroughs that have actually led to the successful application of neural networks to uh, modern day problems. Uh, so nobody, for example, okay, so people may talk historically about the perceptron or the XOR problem and how neural networks could not do the XOR problem, but nobody talks about the S SVM, support vector machines, and, and without support vector machines. And, you know, we wouldn't be talking about neural networks. And since 2010, this was like the big breakthrough, neural networks have become, uh, let's say, the standard way of modeling problems in natural language processing and in machine learning, of course. Um, so we have technology that kind of works and we have a lot of data. Let's see what we can do with it. So um, throughout the talk, I'm gonna use one modeling framework that has been particularly um, um, popular and useful in natural language processing and this is called the encoder decoder modeling framework, and I will explain it um, uh, here so that uh, we're all on the same page. So this framework uh, works as follows. So it assumes that I have, um, that, and, and this, this has been very popular in machine translation. So for a moment, bear with me, assume that I want to translate from English to another language. Here I, uh, we have English as input and the output has to be French. So the way uh, this uh, framework works is uh, it first takes the English as input and every word is represented as a vector. These things here are supposed to represent a vector. It can be a randomly initialized vector. So every word is a vector. I am reading my input sentence, uh, sorry, word by word. So every word I'm reading these vectors and at the end, once I'm finished, this is end of sentence, I have my last, my last representation state here, which is called the hidden state, contains information about the entire sentence. So once I have this, I will take this information and initialize another neural network, which given this input, it will try to decode it. So it will try to predict, think of it as a classifier, that it will try to predict the translation. And again, the decoder takes this vector as input and decodes it step by step. 
So this is the first French word, the second, and at each point that I am decoding, I am taking into account the input vector here, but also all the vectors of the words that I've generated so far. So I have, I'm taking into account my English sentence, but also all the context that I've generated. Now, why is this framework so successful? There is three reasons. First of all, it allows you to do end-to-end -end training. We used to have like these models where we would have one bit that would do something, and the, bit, the, the output of this something would be input to some other module, and this other module, none of this is happening now. So we are training these systems, if you have a long parallel corpus, end-to-end. -end. And it's all uh, an optimization. So the parameters are simultaneously optimized to minimize the loss function. And in the machine translation example, the loss function would be um, how good am I at translating this input English sentence given some training data. The distributed representations allow you to better exploit in NLP in particular similarities between words. So you are better at translating. And you can exploit the context because, like I said, you take into account whatever you have generated so far. And so you can translate more accurately. And because everything is the same big fat model, you can play. So if you don't have enough data, you can get some other data. You represent it as a vector, you can plug it in. So it has this plug and play functionality that is very important. Okay. So essentially though what we are doing is a conditional recurrent language model. So I'm conditioning on the English sentence and at every step I'm predicting the next word of the French language. Because of that though, this is a very flexible framework that is particularly expedient if you want to do translation between different modalities. So for example, I showed you the example with a French and English um, input sentence. I can have an image, and the image is my input. I represent the image as a vector. Before I showed you the linguistic example where each word is a vector, now the, this big fat image is going to be a vector. And again, I will now generate a description, such as the cat sat on the mat. Another example of a language, a conditional language model, is I give the, as input, a field from a database or some description that is not natural language. Um, and here um, it's a, um, some representation that the computer understands uh, that is broken down into attribute value pairs and the system generates an expression such as seven days is a Chinese restaurant. So the way I'm describing, I'm giving you the impression that this is a one size fits all modeling framework. And if that were the case, I should go home and stop talking right now, if it was that easy. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll, I'll show to you what are the research, qu research questions behind this framework and how we can change it to do the tasks that we want. Because just because you know this is like a very general framework, it doesn't mean that you can use it to, to do the translation problems I highlighted in the beginning. Okay, so we will look at this framework across different tasks and dimensions. And I have here the different um, dimensions. So we will look at translation within the same modality, text to text, or between different modalities. And our data will be parallel, like in machine translation, you have the English and you have the French, and it's completely parallel. It's a translation, and we train the model on this data, or comparable where we are not very sure that the things are actually in correspondence. Does it even work? Some, there's a lot of data, but not all of it is in, in, in a clean form. Then we will look at the training size. How much data do we need? We can have a, a very big corpus, or a smaller, or a medium-sized one. And finally, what do we do with the model? How are we going to change it? And I'm going to show three changes. You're changing the training objective, you're changing the decoder or the encoder, and I will explain this throughout. Okay, so, I'll, and I'm gonna uh, illustrate this framework using three tasks, the first of which is simplification. Okay, 
So what is the goal of simplification? The goal of simplification is to make a text easier to read and understand. And if you want to make the internet accessible, you have to worry about simplification. So Google, for example, somewhere hidden in the tools, you can go there and press some buttons and it tells you um, how difficult to read your website is. And it gives you a little value that tells you it's difficult or easy. So simplification is a really important problem. And if you are a non-native speaker and you go to the doctor, the doctor will give you like a simplified leaflet to read because you actually don't know the language. Now, what does the task involve? If I take like a complex text, what do I need to do to make it simpler? Well, there is a lot, it's actually linguistically a, a very challenging task and there is a variety of linguistic operations you need to do that involve deleting words, substituting words, inserting new words, reordering things. So I have an example here. Um, so previous calculations show that due to the solar wind, open parenthesis, which drops 30% of the sun's mass, close parenthesis, Earth could escape to a higher orbit. Now this is, if you're a child, this is not an easy sentence to read or a dyslexic reader or an aphasic reader. And we need to change this. So a professional does this and they take this big sentence due to the solar wind and they actually remove it, as you can see in the second example. So we remove it to the end and we make a simpler sentence. So the parentheses is removed here and goes to the end. So I take this big fat sentence and I split it in two sentences. This is what we call syntactic simplification. I change the structure of the sentence. Another simplification is lexical substitution. And this is a very common um, operation because you don't know the words. The, you don't know the meaning of the words. So you need to substitute the words with simpler words. So again, I give you an example. These alterations are humble, but assist in circumventing the difficulties of ascertaining the meaning of obfuscated sentences. This is deliberately a difficult sentence to read. How am I going to simplify it? I'm just going to substitute some words and turn it uh, to a simpler sentence. These alterations are simple, but help in getting around the difficulties of finding the meaning of confusing sentences. And I've been working on simplification with computers for 10 years, and it still remains a very challenging problem. This is a human who has done this. This is a Wikipedia editor. We'll see how Wikipedia comes uh, into play in a minute. Okay, so in order to simplify text, there is a few constraints that we must abide by. The output must be simpler. It has to be grammatical. I cannot change and give you word salad. And preserve the meaning of the input. And if you don't believe me that it's a, a real problem, I'll just play you two, the speech of two presidents, okay? One is uh, President Trump, uh, or I should say soon to be impeached. President Trump, we don't know that, we don't know that. Okay, so first is President Trump. This is his inauguration address, like when he got the nomination. And the other one is President Obama's farewell speech. And um, I'll play them to you and then I'll, 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 you'll see what I mean about using simple language. Can you hear? So it's well observed, people who studied President Trump's speech, he 
has short sentences, he uses a lot of repetitions, he repeats what he says, and he's um, grade level, so if you take his speeches and you put them into one of these uh, 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 software that tells you the readability difficulty of a text, it's around seven to eight year old. Okay, now let's, let's hear President Trump, um, President Obama, sorry. Okay, so you see the difference here. Abolitionists and creeds come into play. So if you take Obama's farewell speech and you put it into one of the software, the readability level is that of a first year university student. So big gap. So we want a system that will take Obama's speech and turn it into Trump's speech. <laughs> and, and at some point people say to me, don't you want to do it vice versa? Um, different problem. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? So there is Wikipedia. So in order to do this, this is, uh, this is seemingly simple. We need data. There is no such data. Where are we gonna find it? We need a parallel corpus of simple sentences and complex sentences. And we need lots of it because neural networks are data hungry. So one way to approximate this is we take Wikipedia. This is the Wikipedia page for London. And there is a version of Wikipedia called Simple Wikipedia. And simple Wikipedia is written for children and non-native speakers and professional editors write these articles and we just hope, just hope that if we take London's page in the normal Wikipedia and London's page in the simple Wikipedia, we will get some corpus that will not be parallel, it will be very comparable from which the neural network will learn something. This is one data set. Another data set is uh, this New Zealand data set. This is an organization in America where they have professional um, editors who write articles for children. And if you see here, I don't know at the back where you can see this, this is different lengths. So this is an article about girls who code. And here you can click and you will get this article in different lengths and different readability levels for kids that go, you know, primary, high school children, early primary, later primary. And this data set is very parallel. New Zealand released it to the NLP community, which is great, but it's relatively small. So these are the two things we will pl be playing with. And let's see what we're gonna do. So again, remember the, the tasks that we had here. So we are translating from the same modality we have a parallel and comparable corpus. Comparable is the Wikipedia. We, Wikipedia is large, New Zealand is medium sized. And in terms of the model, I'll show you how we do the simplification task by changing the training objective. Okay, so here's the model that I'm having. And by X, this is my complicated sentence. X1, X2, X3 are individual words. And remember, encoder, decoder, it's a different graph, but it's the same model. I'm gonna encode using these vectors my complicated sentence. Then I'm gonna take all of these vectors together and average them and give them as input to the decoder. And the decoder is Y here, Y hat, and it's going to decode the complicated sentence into a simpler sentence. Now, there is a problem with this. If you just run the vanilla encoder-decoder model, 
all you're going to get is a model that just copies. And this is actually reasonable because the simple text is not that different from the complicated text. If you think about it from a model's perspective, the changes are quite subtle. I move one word here, I substitute another word. So the neural network is not that dumb. I mean, it is dumb, but not that dumb. It says, okay, here I'm not changing much. So what I have to learn is just to copy. But I don't want to copy the input. I want to change the input. So we need to enforce the specific constraints that our task has. And the way to do this is via reinforcement learning. So we will view this model as an agent, which reads a source, and the agent then will take an action according to a policy. And the policy here is the probability of my output given everything I've seen before. A probability of all the y's I've generated so far and all of the x's, which is my input. And then the agent will produce some output. This is the output. So I take the complicated sentence as input and I attempt to simplify it. I produce an output. This is now my action sequence. And then I will use reinforcement learning to tell the agent what to do. And the action sequence then will be receiving a reward. And what is this reward? This reward is made up of, it's the sum of three parts. So First, I'm going to have a simplicity model, then a relevance model, and then a fluency model. And I say then, 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 but they're all together. So I produce this simplification. I'm, I'm attempting to produce one. And then I will have this reward, which is made up of ways of measuring how good this is. So the simplicity model will use a formula which is called SARI. You don't want to know this, but people have done research and they have shown that this metric correlates with human perceptions of simplicity. So I'm going to use this measure, this SARI metric, to measure how simple my output is. Then my relevance will just tell me, are you really close to your input? Because remember, I cannot be hallucinating. I cannot change my sentence. I have to simplify it without changing its meaning. And then the fluency model tells you, are you grammatical? Uh, or are you a word salad? And I will use then the reinforce algorithm, which is a very old algorithm, to train the system while changing its training objective. And this objective is very task specific. It takes into account the specifics and the constraints of the task. OK, so let me show you how it works. I, I know th th there will be some bar charts throughout the talk, but I'll tell you what you need to look at. So this shows this axis here. Um, the y-axis is from 1 to 4 and from 0 to 4. And it shows human judgments, how humans judge the simplifications produced by the system. So the higher, the better. And here are different models. You don't need to care about other people's models. So red is us. And we call it DRESS, the model for deep reinforcement sentence simplification. So these are the means that the humans gave to different system output. These are other people's systems that uh, don't use neural networks or use different methods. That's not important. The important thing is to see that this DRESS is better than other systems. and almost approaching this pink bar here, which is the gold standard. So humans were also given human-produced simplifications. This is on this New Zealand data set, which is clean and nice, not very much of, um, but very strictly parallel. Now what happens with Wikipedia is in the next slide. Again, um, all colors but red are uh, other people's work. Here we see that there is also a jump, 3.46 versus 3.34. And it's, very, it's even better than the humans. Why is it better than the humans? Bear in mind, this is highly comparable noisy text. And it's not always right, the simplification. So the model consistently produces simplifications, and the humans tend to like them. Um, OK. Let me show you some output. So um, we use this model dress 
to simplify President Obama's farewell speech. And I'll show you the simplifications. Uh, the system did this out of domain. So at, at no point did it see any word uttered by Obama. We trained it on Wikipedia and Newzella, and then we used it to simplify Obama's speech. And you will see, not by reading it, immediately you will see that it has dropped some stuff because this is a very long sentence and it has made it simpler. So I will read you the simplification. My fellow Americans, I'll be right there with you as a citizen for all my remaining days. So it has dropped an entire clause. Whether you are young or young at heart, I do have one final ask of you as your president. And then he continues talking about holding uh, fast to the faith written in the founding documents and so on. And the system says, hold fast to that faith written into our founding documents, that idea whispered by slaves and abolitionists. And it completely did not talk about homesteaders, etc. cetera. This, uh, the, the model knows nothing about this, so it errs on the side of caution and, of course, shortens President Obama's speech. Okay, so what's the, the take-home message for this task? Well, we've taken this um, encoder-decoder paradigm, which is really uh, taking one sequence, we are treating language as a sequence, and we are translating it into another sequence, and we've enriched it with a task-specific objective. Um, it is interesting to note that this uh, reinforcement learning uh, paradigm can be used for other rewriting tasks, such as shorten, shortening uh, sentences or uh, changing their style. The data is not perfect, will never be perfect, and it will never be huge. And the simplifications are decent, given that, you know, I've shown you examples where the system is um, tasked to do, uh, to, to do simplifications out of domain. Okay, so this was the first task. Now I'm going to move on to another task, which is actually translation between different modalities. Okay, um, and in this task, we will translate from language to code. Why do we want to do that? One may argue, uh, well, in, in NLP circles, one may argue that this is exactly what NLP should be doing. I don't want to be writing in code. I want to be speaking to the bloody machine in my own voice, and I wanted to do what I wanted to do. So the more you see uh, the di digitization of our world, uh, the more imp imperative it will be that the computer understands language. And the computer understands language by translating it to code. So um, can I see with a show of hands, have people heard this if, if this, then that recipes? Oh, okay, good. Excellent, 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 very good. Okay, so um, this is for, this is the, this, is this web page. Um, so the, the, this is a service that they provide where you can actually create little apps that do things for your um, Google Home devices or for your mobile phone, and they're really literally if-then statements. So I give examples here. Um, this is for naive users, not for computer scientists. So you can say things like, archive missed calls from Android to Google Drive. So you will pick this and that, and it will create this app that we will be archiving your calls. Or text me the weather every morning. I actually did this myself, and then it would text me the weather very annoying every morning. And, and in Edinburgh, it's never good. Um, so. Now, this is what the user sees. He sees these boxes, and you click, and then the app is created. Underlying this, of course, is this big tree that consists of triggers and actions. And a trigger would be things like you have an Android phone call, and a phone call missed, and then there is another tree here, blah, blah, blah. The user never sees this, but we want to be able to actually make the translation because I want to be doing more complicated things than if-then statements. Another example is this question, why is, uh, the, well, sorry, what is the highest mountain in Alaska? Usually, when you ask your Google Home or your Alexa engine, they will have a database. They have actually multiple databases where they will take the utterance, they will translate it in some gobbledygook here that the computer understands. And here we say argmax, which is the highest, and we have a mountain here in Alaska, we have Alaska. The computer will understand this, but this is a structured 
query with variables. You see this zero here is a variable. So I want to be able to translate the natural language to this logical form. Another example again is Dallas to San Francisco, leaving after four in the afternoon, please. Um, this is yet another representation. Here we have lambda expressions for those of you who remember them in the good old computer science days. But you know, this is the representation. So I want something. I don't care about the representation, but it should be able to do the translation. And how many people here have an Alexa or a Google Home at home? Yeah, this is exactly. So I bought one immediately when I saw the ad because I thought, okay, I have to know what they're doing. Of course, you don't know, like you get frustrated and because it doesn't understand you. But anyway, so however, nowadays, 500 million people use this digital assistance and the figure is expected, I mean, these are projections, to rise over 1.8 billion people by 2021. I think we should take this with, you know, a bit of caution because it all depends on how they improve and how good they are. But there is a particular reason why I think these assistants on some level are great. And I will just play this to you. One minute. Alexa, what's the time? It's 6 a.m. Can you actually see it at all? A bit. There is a catch. Wait, wait. This is why digital assistants are here to stay. The woman is blind. She doesn't know what the weather is like. Probably she can also, you know, manipulate by Alexa her kettle. She can call her dog by a specific signal. So the potential of these digital assistants to become assistive devices, if they worked, I mean, there's this big if there, is actually quite huge. And it's interesting that Amazon has tapped onto this and created, this is a very recent ad. I just saw it like a couple of days ago. I used to have another ad that uh, was making fun of these assistants, but they, they realize, and in fact, Alexa, they have like these Amazon skills and you can take it and, you know, change it according to your um, uh, needs. Um, so, and there's many people that are lonely or that need reminders to take their medication and so on and so on. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Again, remember this is our picture. Now we're talking about different modalities where the text is strictly parallel. So yes, I need somebody to translate the natural language into this representation that the computer understands for the model to learn. The data is never too big. It's either medium-sized or small. And we're going to change the decoder. We're going to change how we are decoding. OK, now I'll go over this picture, but it's again the same picture. In every slide, it's almost the same picture. So remember the machine translation example or the simplification example. We have a natural language here. What Microsoft jobs do not require a bachelor of science. and I want to translate it to something that the computer understands. So I'm going to treat this as a sequence and the representation language also as a sequence. So despite the fact that the representation language is actually not a sequence, it can be a tree, it can be recursive, but I'm ignoring this for the moment, okay? So I, I'm going to pretend it's a sequence. And what I'm going to do is, again, encoder decoder with this attention layer here. If Ignore it for the moment. It's, it's a way to force the network to pay attention to the input. 
Um, so I'm going to have LSTM here, which is a form of recurrent neural network, to represent the input, and then my decoder is another LSTM that will output the logical form. And this is nice because it uses minimal knowledge. We don't need to know anything about the structure, either of the, neither of the input nor of the output. It's a general model, but there is a problem. It's not guaranteed to actually output well-formed trees. And most of these representations are trees. They are structured, or they could be graphs. Or if you have a big database, it would be a big graph. So what do you do? So I want to force this thing to generate trees. And one way of doing it <laughs> is to actually forcing it to generate an intermediate representation. So I'm going to have this input, all flights from Dallas before 10 AM. And rather than trying to actually do the decoding or the translation in one go, I'm going to first decode it or translate it to a meaning sketch. And the meaning sketch is an abstraction of the big fat representation. It is, you can think of it as, you know, it gets rid of the specific details and gets at the gist of their representation. And here, the red bits, you see, are abstractions. It's, it tells you that I need to fill some stuff here. I don't know what this is, but I don't care at this moment. Let me get the basic structure right, and then I'm going to go and fill it in. So first, I will decode to the meaning sketch, and then I will fill in low-level de details, such as arguments or variable names. And then, once I've generated the sketch, I will do the logical form. OK, why do I want this? So it turns out this is very useful because you can disentangle high level from low level semantics. So if you're familiar with programming languages, you have the semantics of the language. And there is different levels of granularity. You can have very detailed meanings, but you can have not so detailed ones. So I'm just going to get the gist of the meaning and then it will be more compact. So if the meaning is more compact, this is an easier problem for the model to learn. So I have this compact meaning representation and explicit sharing then, and you'll see a picture in a minute, between the core structure. Um, and because of this core structure will be the same for examples with the same basic meaning. So again, the model will be able to generalize better. And we provide global context. I'll show this in a picture for the decoding. OK, so how will it work? Again, we have the natural language here, all flights before. And again, I'm going to encode it using vectors. And then I will decode it into the sketch. Once I decode it into the sketch, which is the coarse grained representation, I'm going to take the sketch and encode it again, again with vectors. And once I've encoded my sketch here, I'm going to finally decode it and fill in the details into the full-blown meaning representation. And there's two important details. The first is that the sketch is encoded here and then given as input to my output. But also, while I'm decoding the big fat meaning, I'm also taking into account the input. So I give more information to the model. Of course, this is all predicated on getting the sketch right. If the sketch is not right, this whole thing does not work. But it is a much easier problem to get the sketch right, because it's shorter and it's more compact. Now, what I haven't told you so far is where do these sketches come from? Say again, I didn't hear. I said absolutely. Absolutely, yes. OK, good, good question, yes. Uh, so. Um, the right answer, which is not the one that I'm going to give, is that you learn the sketches. But we did not learn the sketches because we thought, okay, let's see first, can we actually do it um, with sketches that we know are right? Because if you learn them, of course, you introduce more noise. So it turns out it's very simple. You, if you have logical form, what you do is you just get rid of variable information. So get rid of the lambdas, get rid of arguments, and then you have a more compact logical form. So uh, the blue or purple here is the full form. And then you see 
that this variable here has been substituted to some number. A flight, all of these things are very sim much simpler. And so there is a simple algorithm that goes and strips off this information, and suddenly you have a compact logical representation. Now you may say, yeah, okay, you did this for logical forms. What about source code? Which is my motivating example. How do you actually get rid of source code? So this is an example of Python. This is the Python code here. And it turns out that with Python, it's much easier. You just take these tokens and you substitute them with their token types. Um, so here, four becomes number, lower becomes name, HTTP becomes string. Of course, you have to keep in delimiters, operators, and built-in keywords, because if you get rid of those, then you have nothing. What if you have SQL? Again, very easy. If you know about the syntax of the language, you have a select operator and then a where clause. In this case, you will just, this is the big, a big SQL query that wants to find a record company at a year of recording is after 1996, and the conductor is this Russian, uh, Mikhail Snitko. So we don't care about any of this, we just care about you know, the syntax of the SQL query, which is a where bigger than an end close here and the equal. This will be the sketch. So this is a simple process that you can do for many different types of representation. Okay, does it work? Again, gray, other people's work. Pink, this stands for sequence to sequence, is a simple encoder decoder uh, model without the sketches. And you can see this is course to find, this is the sketches, and it gives you quite a big boost. I should say these data sets um, have been used in the community for many years, and they've been beaten to death, and it's actually difficult to do better. Uh, so a 3% of increase here is a big deal. Um, this is 80s again, 85, you go to 88. More data set, this is WikiSQL, so this is, you have SQL, so this is a range of different types of representations. From 74, you go to 79. Django has Python. From 70, you go to 74. Um, so the, the idea seems to, to force the model to actually produce more accurate representations. So what's the take home message? Well, we use, again, a constraint-based decoder where the decoding is constrained not by reinforcement learning, as we saw in the previous task, but here by this intermediate meaning sketch. Training data, again, will never be large, but um, it's strictly parallel, which helps. And an important research direction is to be able to scale these things across languages, across domains. So the way Alexa works, they have like very many different parsers, we call this semantic parsing, different translation modules for different tasks. So they have, will have the travel domain, they will have the weather domain, they will have the sports domain, they will have the Boris Johnson domain. No, I don't think they do, but, but, but you see, they, they will have all of these things, and we want something that works across domains. Okay, you've been very brave. Last task, summarization. And um, a particular type of summarization, which is movies. So there is a lot of uh, video in the internet. YouTube is Google's most successful, one of the most successful enterprises. Who can see all this video? Nobody. You really want to be able to summarize it. Now, just summarizing a person's video, like if you see me dancing, that's not that interesting. I'm sorry, I mean all these video users. So we thought, okay, ideally you want to be able to summarize video, but let's start, start with something that has some quality control, and these are movies. So movies, uh, if, I would, if I might say, are really the test for, the litmus test for understanding, either for natural language or for computer vision. And they're very interesting. First of all, they're a form of literature, so somebody has actually thought about writing the script that becomes a movie. They are multimodal because you have the, te the screenplay and you actually have the movie, so you have video. They imitate real life, um, things happen, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, uh, and also they're not sequential, 
And a screenplay is like a book. It's a big fat thing that, you know, um, what do you do with it? And they're very interesting also from a modeling perspective because if I tell you now that I will encode an entire screenplay into a vector, you'll sit here and laugh at me because a screenplay is like 100 pages long. It's not like a, a short sentence. How am I going to do that? So this is a very interesting problem. Uh, here I show Genie. I don't expect that people will know Genie. You have to pay to get it. Um, it's like Netflix has the same, so you give a search term. I want a feel-good movie that is witty and indie. And you get all the movies that you may like. And Genie does content analysis, so it takes these movies and it analyzes in some way and produces a result. And it knows something about the content of the movies. Okay, so we want to summarize movies. And we humans do it very easily. It is a very natural task to the point that there is this eight-year-old, True, she's in America. Now she's not eight, I think she must have grown, maybe she's 10. Anyway, she's somewhat of a YouTube sensation. She goes and watches movies, and then she has her own channel, and she summarizes these movies for other children. And I'll play you how she summarizes the movie Zootopia, and it's perfect. I w I, the machine cannot do it, okay? This is something we are aspiring towards. But it illustrates how natural the task is to a human. So this movie is about a rabbit named Judy Hopps rabbit. who wants to be a police officer and make the world a better place. And in order to do that, she needs to go to Zootopia to become a police officer. And she really wants to go on like a lot of missions, but the chief makes her a meter maid because all the police officers, I think, are predators. And... In Zootopia, there's mostly predators, but she's, well, she's not a predator. So she tries to be a police officer, and who, and a buddy can't be a police officer, or can a buddy be a police officer? <laughs> so this is, this is the gist of the movie. We can't do that. This is something to dream about. What we will do instead is we will take a movie, like The Silence of the Lambs, and we will produce a summary that describes its, co its content, but it's meta. And by meta, I mean it's about the movie, but not about what the movie is about. So I'll read this to you a bit. The Silence of the Lambs can be described as tense, captivating, and suspenseful. The plot revolves around special agents, mind games, and a psychopath. The main genres are thriller and crime. In terms of style, it takes a strong fem it stars a strong female character. It is serious and realistic. It's located in Maryland, Virginia. Uh, it takes place in the 1990s. It is based on a book. It has received attention for being a modern classic, blah, 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 blah. So if you like special agents and mind games and psychopaths, you know this is your movie. OK, now what generated this? A human has created this. but taking this database into account where we have attributes and values. So there will be a mood attribute, suspenseful, captivating, a plot attribute, a genre attribute, and so on. Okay? So what are we going to do? So our goal is to take the movie as input, somehow model through, and output this text. And in order to do that, we need to create some data. So we need to have scripts. We need to have movies. We need to have captions, OK? And we will create this data set. And this is what we're working with. And in terms of our um, plan here, we are looking at different modalities. We're looking at comparable data. And we will change the encoder. So one way to do this would be to take the movie and the screenplay, the script, turn it into a vector, and generate the summary. This will not work. I mean, uh, please try. It will produce, we tried, rubbish. So what we will do is we will use this screenplay and this movie to actually turn it into a database. And from this database, then, we will generate the summary.
And our data base will be these attribute value pairs that I showed to you, these things. So from these, we will go to the summary. So the decoder will be conditioned on attribute value pairs, and this is a multi-label classification problem, and we will learn the whole network jointly. And I will show you a daunting picture, and I'm almost done, I have two more slides. So this picture, I know, is horrible. But it's horrible, but uh, it is interesting, and I'll tell you why. So this bit here tells you I have some input, I have some features, some hidden states, and this is my encoder here. So I give it a screenplay or features from the movie. It can be video, it doesn't matter. And I'm going to predict these attribute level values, but I'm never actually going to predict them. I'm going to produce these vectors that will be fed into this decoder that will output the summary. So because of the neural networks being so plug and play, I can plug in movie and screenplay, have an intermediate representation that is never seen. I mean, you need to evaluate and see that you're actually predicting these things, and then output the summary. And here, this is complicated. There is an LSTM cell that generates a summary, and this is a content selection cell that you need because you ca there's many attributes. There's 200 attributes and their values. You need to select which ones to talk about. And this is also learned. Everything is learned. Okay, I'm skipping this slide. This is the features. I told you all of that. Now, this is humans reading these summaries and telling you are they good or not. And again, ignore the rest. Um, this is our model, which we call Morgan. Um, it seemed the student liked Morgan Freeman. I don't know why. Um, so um, 82.5 versus 60%. And this is the gold standard. So the model seems to be doing pretty well. It generates these admittedly formulaic summaries, but all right. And I'll show you an example. Which one should I read? Uh, run, uh, burn after reading or Lara Croft? Let's do Lara. The, the, I mean, this is the older version. There's a contemporary Lara Croft movie. Okay, Lara Croft Tomb Raider can be described as a suspenseful and rough. The plot centers around danger, a master villain and deadly. It's not perfect, okay? The model is not perfect. Lara Croft Tomb Raider is an adventure, thriller, an action movie. In approach, it is fantastic. It means fantasy. Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, see it repeats, it doesn't know anything about coreference, takes place at least partly in Europe. <laughs> Note that it involves profanity. <laughs> okay. But it generates these things, we cannot believe it. I remember 10 years ago, I told the student, why don't you summarize movies? And the student laughed at me, th thought that something was wrong with my head. Okay, so take home, uh, the encoder will select these attributes and generate them. Uh, and neural networks are very well suited to the tasks involving multiple modalities. And uh, this problem is very interesting because there is a lot of data. You have all the data from the movie and all the data from the screenplay, but not in terms of instances, not in terms of training examples. You cannot have, how many movies can you have? 200, 300, you cannot have hundreds of thousands. Okay, in conclusion, and I'll leave you in peace. Um, so this is, I, um, I don't have any take home messages, any grand schemes, but I'll, I'll close with this quote from Larry Page, which is very interesting. Um, he says, artificial intelligence could be the ultimate version of Google. It also shows their ambition, of course. The ultimate search engine that would understand everything on the web. It would understand exactly what you wanted and it would give you the right thing. We're nowhere near doing that now, I agree. However, we can get incrementally closer to that, and that is basically what we work on. He and everybody else, of course. And with that, I will take any questions if uh, you have, and thank you for your attention. Okay. If there's time, is there okay. time? Yes. So there should be time. So thanks a lot, Mirella, for the no problem. most interesting talk. Um, questions? Yes. I have a very quick question. It may just be, yeah. No, no, please, please ask. Uh, uh, I'm curious if you, I'm curious if you gave Trump's speech, could you make it, uh, raise it from kindergarten to uh, first year university? 
Right? Yes, 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 yes. So um, in principle, yes. So in principle, you could do it. So right now, I'm taking simple text. I'm taking complicated text and turn it into simple. I could take complicated text and turn it into, I, I could take simple text and turn it into complicated. There is a problem though, so I could do it, but the network, the model would hallucinate a lot because Trump is compact. I need to insert stuff that the model has not seen. Like a human could do it very well, but I, I think for example, you would get, it could be very difficult. So the model will pick up on the fact that, you know, he's lacking all these like complicated and long words and he would put them in. But in principle, yes, you could certainly do it and even use reinforcement learning to force it to a specific level by penalizing it if it uh, generates very complicated words or, or not complicated. I have not tried this. And you know, if you talk to people that go like, oh, the legal implications of this and the whatever. So, uh, yes. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. So uh, what are the key problems? I think even though I say there is a lot of data, blah, 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 data increases, uh, data is a key problem. And having good data to learn good models is an, an, another very key problem, very important problem. So the thing is that all of the stuff that I showed to you is supervised learning. And there's so much you can do with supervised learning. And for some languages, for example, this is another talk I should give to you. What happens if you want to do that like in Chinese or in, you know, if the world does not only have English, so, and we don't have this data. So I think from a machine learning perspective, you really have to look into unsupervised learning. And my experience with unsupervised neural network models is that they don't really work or they're very tricky to get them to train and whatnot. So from the machine learning perspective, unsupervised learning is something that we all need to look at and they need to work out. Um, there ha so there's w one of these problems. The other problem that is becoming increasingly important is people think, and this is not a science, so much of a science issue, because the stuff is out there and it works to a degree, they can use it. And, and they use it and you get things like, you know, you can do face recognition. Now there was this thing on the BBC News with the actress where she finally saw herself like acting in a porn movie. This was all synthesized and somebody used this and she goes like, I didn't act in this movie, an American actress. So guarding the technology and not putting it out there half-baked is another problem that, you know, legislation or whatever. But from the science point of view, I think uh, the models need to be able to be more robust and Working with little data or with not supervised data is, is something that uh, I would say is the most important at this point. Right. So, so some of the some of the advancements will be really in optimization. Um, some of the advancements will be in, in, in pure machine learning because, uh, for example, if you use unsupervised methods like autoencoders, there is this thing called posterior collapse and they don't work. So somebody needs to work out fundamental methods to get these things. Because if we crack unsupervised learning, or at least, you know, you have a little bit of supervised data and you use some unsupervised data and, yeah. So you don't much work into hybrid approaches. Yes. So what you must have had some improvements with hybrid approaches, especially with regards to reinforcement. So for example, natural language to programming languages, there are a number of grammatical techniques that you can use that are well known. What degree of success have you seen? Yes, yes, that's a good question. So uh, before uh, this paper, before 2016, this is when we published the first paper that uh, did a language to code with a neural network. The whole community, hundreds of papers, use these hybrid approaches where you have a grammar, the grammar will generate the logical form, and then you would score this grammar using features. 
Um, and this was very successful. Nobody's using this nowadays. And the problem with this approach was that the process had to be repeated every time for every single logical form. You needed different features. You probably needed different grammar. SQL is different from logical form. Now, but the hybrid, the hybridness comes up in other places. It's not like that we have forgotten it. There is a lot of work trying to make sure that the source code is a tree, the well-formedness, because this is a structure prediction problem. So trying to make sure that the structure works, and people, there is work on you know, um, decoding to a graph. How can you get the neural network to decode into a graph? This is a real problem. Um, um, you get approaches where you use a neural network and you do re-ranking. You sort of output several different solutions, several different uh, uh, logical forms, and then you will re-rank it given some knowledge. So knowledge has not gone away completely, uh, and you see this, this hybrid approach is creeping back, but very differently from before. So, yes, yeah, yes. Yes, but yes. Essentially, they're magician's tricks. That's what I'm really asking. Have you tried applying the magician's tricks on top of this very clever approach? Yes, yes. And they are, yes. And, and uh, so I'm very sympathetic, of course, and I would like these things to work. And um, we've tried. The students have tried. It's a lot of work. And these approaches will give you a gain. So uh, sequence to graph, for example or graph to sequence. And these models are lovely. They are like elegant. You can take neighborhoods into account and then do the optimization. But it's a lot of hassle for very little um, gain. Um, so, and this is my honest answer. I mean, you can write papers and say this and blah, 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 and, and the papers are beautiful, but, um, and nothing beats, like if you have a lot of data, you should use the simple model. They work okay. And, and it solves the task. If you don't have a lot of data, or if your data is not clean, or if there's properties in the data where you want to, like, you know, then we can talk hybrid. One question, one more question. Sure. So, how, yeah, so how do you feel about three years? How do you, how do you feel about So how do you feel about brute force uh, approaches to translation? Brute force, you mean? Uh, Use every trick you can at the same time in parallel, regardless of whether it's successful, yeah. and fight it out at the end. Yeah, I, I don't like this. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, they work. I don't. I don't find. Actually, I don't think. So yes, you will get the numbers and you will do your translation, um, but it's not a principled approach. I mean, ideally, I would like a principled approach that I have something that works beautifully, and and I think the community we are getting there slowly, slowly. Okay, any other question? One probably final question. Oh, so I, I didn't mean to have the last word. Uh, my name's John Tay. I'm actually one of Karen Spark Jones' research students. Um, oh, but, wow. Uh, and who were here to celebrate, of course. And something I th most people don't realize now was that uh, Karen's uh, PhD thesis, in I think accepted in 1964, was groping towards... Um, machine learning approaches to natural language processing, which, of course, was extremely unsuccessful, as you correctly point out, to the 1990s. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to see the progress you've made. I was very interested in a particular statement about the code translation problem. Um, one of the problems with supervised machine translation, which is most of what you've talked about, is, of course, the thing they didn't know in 1964 that they didn't know when I was doing a PhD and played with some machine learning was just how much data you'd need to make these things work. Not just technically more advanced neural networks, but these enormous data sets. You said for the sketches yeah, that you, you don't need... Have relatively, I yes. take it, you didn't have that on the slide, but yes. relatively small data sets to train yes. the sketches. Yes. My absolutely was, of, you know, you need training data for this approach. How small are those training sets? Yeah. And Very how good do question. you generate them? Very good question. Thank you. So, um, 
so for machine translation, we have hundreds and thousands of parallel uh, sentences. For uh, the sketches that I've shown and for the semantic parsing, uh, the data set uh, ranges from 600 to 12 or 20,000, okay. which is much less. And when we first tried this, we said it will never work out of the box. Now, what I didn't say this, it, it, what I didn't say during the talk, and, and this is important, you need to do some pre-processing if you have 600 examples to get things so you need to normalize the numbers, you know. Some thought needs to be taken into how will I represent these things to be able, you need to take, get rid of proper names and then substitute them at the end. But in general, it's nothing, you know, nothing very difficult, but it works because they are repetitive and because there is this core meaning that is repeated across examples. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's all we've got time okay. for in terms of all right. questions. I would like to uh, pass the virtual microphone yeah, to Professor down. Karen Shankland from the University of Stirling, who is going to give the book of thanks. Okay, I'm going to keep this quite short and simple. Um, I think we've had a really fascinating talk from Mirella. Um, one of the reasons that we have the Karen Spark Jones lecture is because we want to raise the profile of women in computing research. Um, and I think, you know, Mirella has, has done a great job as a kind of role model tonight to say, here are some really fascinating things that we should all be really concerned about um, in, in computing research. Um, and I hope that uh, those of you who are here go back to your institutions and organisations and encourage more folk to come to the lecture in the future. That would be uh, really good. We're especially interested in uh, connecting to younger people as well. Not that I'm implying anything about the particular age group here, but uh, you know, we, we do want to address that problem of how do we get more young people interested, a diverse range of young people interested in Yes. I was going to say, I am, I'm a little bit older, um, but I'm studying at the University of Hertfordshire doing the computer science program, and I'm actually, a, a, I was a director of music for 14 years, and I've I switched to computer science teaching, and now I'm teaching my first day levelers, and I've gone and I've signed up for the masters, I'm in my second year. And what we're doing at the moment is we're using machine learning to create a language for beatbox, which runs alongside regular music. So I'm working with a lot of young people, but they just didn't want to come tonight. <laughs> it's just, I don't know what it is. It's just, it's not trendy enough. I don't know, but they probably would have enjoyed this, but I don't know how to get them to come along. But they probably would have actually loved that. They can watch. But, uh, the they presentation, I think, they were liked, but it's the, the, I don't know how to say it in a nice way, like the crowd or, or just the, the way. It's, it's just, it's considered for old people. I mean, oh, I, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not, yeah. they, they're not, they're not sort of, if it, the thing is, if you get a group to come, they will follow. Yeah. You've got to get a group, yeah. and then they'll start following the group. But they would have loved that. I know they would have, because we've, yeah. we've got current things so going on. next year, lecture on beatboxing. Yay! <laughs> 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 Excellent, thank you very much. Um, okay, so, um, first of all, Mariella, you were, Amazing and entertaining, Thank you. and Pleasure. I, I was just astounded. Um, I look forward to um, using your tool um, the next time I have to write a long document that is already 7,000 words over what it's meant to be, and you make it shorter but still with the same meaning. Um, thank you very much to Imperial College for hosting us here tonight. Um, usually we're at the BCS offices, but we wanted to try being in the university for um, a change. Um, just a quick show of hands, um, how many people here really enjoyed coming to the university to see the talk rather than go to BCS offices? How many people don't really care? <laughs> okay. How many people would rather be at BCS? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, particularly, uh, thank you very much to uh, Dr. Jackie Bell, who's done a lot of the organisation um, here at Imperial and been the sort of main liaison for BCS. Um, which also reminds me to say, BCS, thank you very much for 
organising this and um, Pam Feeding, especially, who has kept us all on track and organised um, all the details of this. Uh, she has also been amazing. And uh, lastly, thank you very much to IBM for making this thing possible as well and also for funding the lovely uh, drinks reception that we have now um, afterwards. I hope you will stay and do a bit of networking and perhaps ask Mirella more difficult questions <laughs> um, and also 